everybody, welcome to this Board Game Life, episode number 83, titled Size Matters. This is a show about games, board games, card games, anything else we want to talk about. I'm one of your fine hosts for today. My name is Rob, and as always, I got my super mega bestest bud, Mr. Mark. Hey, 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 what's up, Rob? You got a new title today. I noticed. That's awesome. Super mega. Super mega. Super, Super mega, mega turbo deluxe. <laughs> uh, no, what's that? Did do? I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I blew it. I ruined it. Yeah, moment is gone. Supreme. <laughs> <laughs> Throw that in there. And anything else? Uh, like uh, from the fast food world, probably works. Like <laughs> mega. Supersized, <laughs> sure, all of all, all of the above. Oh, uh, but yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, different sizes of board games and uh, some thoughts on that. But before we get onto that, or, or did, is there anything you wanted to bring up before we get on with the shoe? Sure, a really good shoe. That was our nice, beautiful it, it, to the table into that little dice roll. <laughs> I was gonna so say. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say. Did you get? Uh, did you roll for initiative? <laughs> I gotta find something so much better than that. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, you know, spruce up the show here and uh, try to yeah. get some like stingers, as they call them in the industry. Yes, and I'm like that just does not work. But <laughs> I gotta find something like a good sound effect for to the table but it'll yeah. that's what we get today a single <laughs> dice roll <laughs> but i did get to play some stuff this week i got yeah. some new stuff in i got some old stuff in so one of the newest ones that i've played um uh, was a game called survival of the fattest oh this yeah you is, brought this one up last time not, oh, did not I, that you played it but that you just got it Oh yeah, yeah. I had just gotten it after you know it was like a year past, you know. Um, yeah. What do you? <laughs> it's what it past do? Yeah. It's, it's the Kickstarter <laughs> that you forget about. Exactly. Basically, and it shows up, and you're like, "Don't I already have this?" <laughs> so this is. Um, I actually I did get to play it. And I've only got to play it once, but I want to play it again. I, I played with my aunt and my mother. They didn't really care for it, but I actually liked it. And I think it was, I think if they, I kind of feel if they would have played it again, they needed to give it another shot. They would have kind of caught on to some of the mechanics that were just something new for them. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to get this one out again, hopefully with my game group. I, We'll see what they think of it, but I kind of liked it out of, out the gate. Um, just took a little bit to like figure out. When I remember reading through the rule books, it was kind of confusing because I was like, "Wait a minute! Like, here's these things you do, but it's like everyone does. There's like these four phases. Like, you do uh, one player does their first phase, and the next player does their first phase." And then, then you go back to the other person. It's like they do this. It's kind of weird. And it took me a, a moment to, like, figure out, like, how the actual gameplay works. Like, how how it goes in your turn order. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, I thought it was really kind of neat um, the way it worked. So, I don't know. I, I like it. I will, I got to play more of it to get a better kind of a report on the game. And, um you know, I, I've been thinking to Rob and probably should not say this on the air, but I really think I want to get to get some uh, cameras in my game room. And like when I get something like this, especially like a Kickstarter, especially like maybe one like this, that's not going to be as a well known. It's not like arcs, you know, or everybody yeah. was like the big hit. People are like, what the heck is survival of the fattest? You know, this is might be one that may never hit retail. <laughs> it might be <laughs> yeah. one of those Kickstarters, but um, I'd like to show it off and, and you know, maybe even do like uh faux gameplay of it or something. Um, oh, heck yeah. I think oh, that I would mean, be cool. We, we've got a channel on YouTube um, that hasn't had content in a while and uh, it would be perfect. 
Yeah, we need to get our we need to get these audio up there. We can do that. I can assist with that, but that'd be a good start. But yeah, I think there's something I'm, I've been kind of thinking about, and I think I'm going to try to figure out a way to make that happen. I think that'll be fun to do. But um, so if we do, maybe I'll start off with survival of the fattest um, and see how that goes. So, yeah. uh, and I think that would be fun to, for people to be able to see. Um, but anyways, I did get that played. And again, I'm going to get, get it again. So I can give, provide some more information on it. Maybe a review. Got to play Mountain Goats some did, more. Did you get the sort of uh, deluxe Kickstarter edition or the standard? Oh, I, I got the deluxe. I got the deluxe all all in. Uh, I forget. I think that's called the Kickstarter edition. And yeah. I know on BGG they had that. And then I got an email the other day that they're like, "Well, we're merging this into just the the main game." One. Yeah, yeah, into one, which is fine, but um, makes more sense to. <laughs> You know, you got one game. It doesn't you don't need to have a separate entry for the different versions. Yeah, so, yeah, so it looks I, like I think they have it on there. I think they might even list it. Yeah, because I'm looking at the Kickstarter page. Yeah, it looks like the deluxe has miniatures instead of standees, custom insert. Yeah, the and then maybe yeah, the some deluxe Kickstarter edition version is, which I think. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's another. There is a lower tiered version of it because I think you have standees Standard. instead of. Yep. But because I got both, they both came in there. Oh, one of those. Okay. So, because yeah. I got the so deluxe like, edition, you get like everything. So it's basically the same packaging and then you get the extra little bag of goodies, which are like the the Kickstarter ones. Yeah. I got the, um, the, the, the nice, the nice miniatures and stuff that mm-hmm. came with it. And yeah, of course I wish they were painted like they are in the picture, man. Those are nice. Yeah. Makes me want to, makes me want to paint mine. That's another thing I need to start doing, but yeah, anyways. So yeah, the, this is a, basically you're trying to, the interesting thing about this game, I will say this is that you're trying to feed your critter. So you pick a critter out and you're trying to feed them through spring, summer, and fall before winter. And then if you fed your critter, then they, they survive. And then you basically are, are adding up your points that you had to see who wins. Well, when we played, none of us got to feed our critter. So none of us, none of our critters survived. So we all lost the game. (laughs) Oh, wow. So it's like, you can't all lose. Um, yeah. So that's like, okay, this was just a training game. We obviously were focusing on the wrong thing here. And, but it was like, I, you know, trying to learn the mechanics and um, like where to, cause it's a worker placement. And then what you're doing, different things are happening depending on where you're placing your, your characters. Um, and you're trying to get these gather food and recipes to, complete these to score points and there's there's traps and stuff in the game that will you know you don't want and it's a, it's a deck builder but it's uh it is it's a lot of fun i i'm gonna have to go through this and um and play this again i really did enjoy it because you can end up like in um like not an auction but there's there's like a market and um i forgot what the other thing is called let me see if I can see it in this picture, but no, I can't. But there's like two places where you can put your character on the board and one and you can basically take like trade a card from your hand for one that's on display. Or the other one is you can like, again, it's like you can take a recipe. So it's either like you're taking a food item or a recipe card from one that's on display. And the other places you're going to you're going to go there and dep- depending on how what's called like forage action. So you have these forage cards that have numbers on them. And so if you're going to a place and you can forage, like depending on how many cards you have in your hand that are forage cards, you can basically take those many cards off that deck that's um, face down. But if someone else is there, then it's like you're both, you both play your forage cards out 
And then that's how, so if there's like seven total, you pull seven cards out face up. And then whoever has like the highest number uh, of forage card gets to go first and they can pick any of the seven to take. And then it goes back and forth between them. So um, you're, you're gathering what you can to put into your deck for future, for future roles and stuff. So it, it can be interesting. So you can kind of go and get, you know, how you're going to move and depending, like if you're the last person to move, you can go to an area that maybe nobody's at and then you can forge and take all the cards. But if you go where someone else is, it's going to present, it's going to put more cards out and you might have more options, but the other player is going to be taking every other card. So it might limit what you're able to get. So that can be a little uh, strategy there as well. So Anyways, enough of that. Well, it is, it is, I found it to be a fun game. So, uh, the other stuff that I have played, I did get to play a, a Mountain Goats. Um, played that again with my aunt and my mom. They, they it's enjoy cool that game. one. Yeah. It's a fun game. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a perfect, fun, quick little, like, starter game for the evening. Yeah. Right? Very easy for anyone to learn. Um, played some more Finca. Yeah, hey. Um, got to play some Jaipur with uh, uh, with you on BGA. And then I can't remember if I mentioned this last time. Did I talk about Scout on our last episode? Mm, I'm not I, sure. So huh. I can't I remember. So. I think it happened afterwards. So I went to a game night and someone brought out Scout. And I was like, oh, you know what? I did mention this. Because I mentioned it on our last show because of uh, Raw. I played Raw as well, and that was I mentioned that last time. So anyways, if you remember from the last episode, I was talking about how the first time I played Scout, I didn't get it, didn't make any sense. I thought it was stupid. Then the last time I played, the next time I played it, someone brought it out. I was like, fine. I caught on real easy, and I'm like, this is so easy. How did I not get this last time? And it's a great game. I loved it. And I ended up buying it and I have now since played it again. <laughs> so I I really do enjoy this game. And I taught this one to my mother and my aunt as well. I guess that's, that's my aunt was in visiting. So I, I, most of these games were with them um, and they really enjoyed it. So it became an instant favorite amongst all of us. So that's Scout. I uh, did get to play Arcs and this game is... Wow, there's a lot going on. There is, it is not a deck builder, but it is a, like a deck, like hand management, maybe. I'm not exactly sure how to, there's so many things in this game. I'm not even sure how to classify it. I guess I should look at the, uh, the BGG and see what they say about it. But there, there is a lot in this, but I'm still not sure. I've only played it once. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about this game. It is a, they call it a sci-fi strategy game. Let's see if they talk about, um, I thought they always had like a list of mechanics of, I thought they listed that on BGG where they would tell you, oh, here you go, mechanisms, uh, action points, area majority, area movement, campaign battle, card-driven, dice rolling, uh, hand management, negotiation, trick-taking, turn order, claim action, uh, variable play powers. There's, uh, so those are just like all that stuff, plus die icon or resolution. It, it, that's right, it, I forgot. It is a trick-taking, but it's it's not like not like a typical trick taker that I've ever played. It's very, very different. It's a very unique game. It's a very interesting game. There is a lot going on. I, I think I was enjoy, I was kind of enjoying it, but there's just so much there to try to wrap my head around it. Um, this is a heavy game. It, it's weighted 3.36. I think that's, yeah, that might be right. I, that's probably right. They, they're, you know, but to me, this is definitely a heavy game. I definitely need to play it again a couple more times to try to wrap my head around this. And even the people that were playing it 
they were playing again this week. Um, and I wasn't in that one, but the guy who owns it, he was like, yeah, I'm, he's like, I'm, I'm starting to, he's played it a couple of times now. And he's like, I still need a few more to really kind of figure out all the different things that can be done. Cause there's a lot of play options in this game about the, you know, moving your armies or your ambitions or how you're playing the cards and, you know, when to take initiative. And there's, there's just a lot to it. The, I was kind of in kind of liking the game. Uh, again, it was the first time I've only played it once. So I don't want to make a judgment on it on a single play. But one thing I didn't like was that there was um, a time where somebody moved into my area and I had a bunch of ships around my city and, but they were able to attack the city w- with regardless of my fleet being around it. And I don't like that because they were able to basically wipe out my city despite my fleet being there. And I felt that's like, to me, that just doesn't seem right. I feel like they should have to de- defeat your, your, your fleet first, make you defenseless before they can go after the city or the city or the planet. But there's, it's kind of handled in the, the way the dice are. So if you're doing a raid, you put yourself at risk because when you're rolling these dice, if there's fresh ships there, they can attack you and basically, you know, wipe you out um, and they can't take the damage. I think that's how it worked. Um, so there's a really good risk of, you know, it, it's very risky to do it. But like in this case, the guy was able to do it and nothing happened to him. And I was just like, like he rolled the perfect dice. Like, like the odds were like, this should never happen. And he did. And I'm just like, that just, I don't know. It just kind of took the wind out of my sails. Like, why do I have all these ships here? If they're gonna, if it's pointless to, you know, they can't protect your, your base. But I gonna. I got to move past that <laughs> yeah, yeah. and understand it's the way of the dice roll and the, you know, it, it does make it risky for them to do that. And he just, he pulled it off and got lucky. Um, but it really was like, just really sucked the, the air out of the room for me. Um, but I'll, I'll, we'll play it again. Um, I do see the draw of it, but there there's, it's a heavy one for me, man. Woof. Um, on the lighter side, I got to play Captain Flip, played some more Tapple, and I played Racco, like a game from like the 50s, which is still a fun game to play. So all of those I got in this week and then or the last two weeks. But a new one that I got to play was so when I went to game night this week, I I could I was late because I had another engagement. So I didn't think I was gonna get to go, but I did. And so when I got there, one group was playing Arcs, another group was playing Hadrian's Wall. And that was one I hadn't played before. So I was just sitting there uh, watching, kind of visiting with both groups and watching both groups play. Um, And then uh, the Hadrian's Wall team, they had finished their game and asked if I wanted to come join them. They were going to play it again. So I joined them and got to, to learn and play Hadrian's Wall, which is a game that I have heard a lot about. And I've heard it's like really good. And I remember like looking at it before, like, oof, this just looks like too much. So I was like, okay, I'll try this. Dude, I had to come home and buy that, order that game. Oh, wow. (laughs) I, and I've played it on, it's on BGA. And I, I was playing it last night on my, on my iPad, um, playing it on BGA, just doing a solo run through because you can play it solo. It's, it's really fun. It's really good. There is, it's like a, it's not a roll and write, but it, it feels like a, more like a flip and write or something, but it it is, you, you get these, you flip a card to start and everyone gets the same amount of resources to start the game. And then you get some resources based on this card that you, out of your deck that you draw for that calendar year, there are either six rounds and your first, you know, so you pick out a, a card every round and you get those resources. And then you're, you basically are using those resources on your sheet. And it's one of those, like, kind of like a draft and write 
kind of reminds me of draft and right in a way, like as you're getting, as you play a piece out, you know, it might give you another piece like, or right. it, it'll give you, there's all this type. You're trying to chain as many things together as you can. And there are so many things that you can do. There's things you will probably, I mean, you'll go through a game and never touch certain parts of this, of the sheath. You, Cause you just can't fill it all in. I don't think that's even possible, but there's, it has so many ways of people to play this game differently even though they all start out with the same community pieces, but then everything will change a little based on like how you play each year. Uh, so, you know, the next year you might start out with more bricks or more yellow guys or more purple guys or whatnot. Um, and these pieces will go and do certain things like building buildings and building roads. And they all give you certain things and you have to build this wall essentially trying to construct this wall to protect your people from this invading army that's going to come in at the end of every every round and you never know where they're going to where they're going to attack they will attack on the left side and down the front or off to the right so you're trying to build up defenses along those fronts and but you never knowing where they're going to attack no one knows where they're going to attack and then at the end of the first round then you start flipping cards and every year more and more, more and more cards are going to be flipped because there's going to be more attacks and it gets, can get pretty crazy by the end. Um, so you lose points and stuff uh, for every enemy that gets through and you're trying to figure, you know, best figure out how to put blockades up, you know, this, this wall. Um, and it's, it's pretty crazy, man. It It's, it's a lot of fun. And I, what I like about it is how at the end of the game, I look at kind of what I did and I'm like, Ooh, I got my wall all the way across. So I met one of my like personal objectives, but I was looking at my scoring and I was like, I was like, well, I didn't score many points. And I look over at someone else and they had a ton of points. I was like, Whoa, you know? And it's just like yeah. how they played, you know, what, what they're, you know, they went like the market route, which I still don't really know exactly what that does, but you know, some, someone else could go a different, you know, there's so many different options of how to use these resources that it's like, I think no two games are ever going to be the same. Okay. Um, it, it's just, it's very interesting um, of just the mass amount of options and everyone's playing at the same time. So I really, I thought that was really cool because you know, everyone, like we all collect these resources from the center supply and then we just start. So everyone is just, you're, you're, oh, I'll put my, I'm going to use my yellow guy on to, uh, put it into this citizen that, you know, so you put the yellow guy back in the middle, but because you used them, it gives you a blue guy. So you pull a blue guy resource out of the pile. And then, so everyone's doing this all at the same time until everyone's done. And then, then you, you um you end that that year and do the attack and then we see how you know who had who survived who who took the hits and then you go into the next year and then we start that whole process over and you you should be as you're progressing there's ways to get more and more resources each calendar year like you might get more people for certain areas you might get more brick to help to advance your wall things like that really fun I, I love it. I this game's on its way. I can't wait to have it in Anne. But I also love that I can play this on BGA as well. And it's the nice thing about BGA is it it does all the work for you. <laughs> you just click and it's like boom and you, you're you know it yeah. makes it really quick. But it is fun. I, I love these like games where you're you know you're putting pen to paper and you're you're chaining things you're trying to okay if i use this guy here it gives me this oh but if i go over oh if i use this first then i can come over here and i can get this bonus which then be combined with the other ones i have i can go and do this other thing so it's uh it's a thinker it, it's a thinking draft and right roll and right flip or whatever you want to call it there's no rolling of dice but i don't i don't know what you call it <laughs> Okay. Super yeah. fun. Yeah, I've I've looked at this game many times and never, you know, bit the bullet and, and picked it up. But 
now you've definitely got me intrigued with this and you hyped it up enough. Well, you, it's, it's going to be will, a snag for me. You will be able to play it at yes. uh, TB GL con 2025. Cause yes. it'll be available. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So yes, really good. I'm like so excited that, yeah, that's the best part about a game group is, you know, if mm-hmm. you've got people that are it'll bring things, you know, like I probably would have never played arcs. I would have never played this game. Um, and it's just like, wow, this is great. Now this isn't a game that I would like teach my mother. It, it's definitely, right. she's not going to, it's, it's not going to be for her. Um, but it's something that I really enjoy and there's still so much like, okay, I still don't know what some of the things do. And so I'm really looking forward to getting the getting the rule book and taking a look at it and playing some more on BGA when I you know now even though I can play it a single player I can just do it on BGA and then save the paper for when mm-hmm. I take this to game group and play with with other people so yeah yeah excellent excellent game but that's what I got to the table okay. <laughs> I swear, that sounds like a real die. You are you rolling something over there? <laughs> no, that's just a yeah, sound I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> if I was rolling dice, I'd have a bunch, man. I'd have a whole bunch I'd roll on my yeah, table. Yeah, roll them like through a dice tower. Exactly. Onto the table. So you're like this huge crash of dice. You know, maybe that's everything. what I'll do. I'll get my like uh, wingspan bird wooden bird tower out. Mm-hmm. And I'll throw a bunch of dice through that and just record the sound make my own <laughs> there you go no but that's uh that's what i got to the table okay all right so um just wanted to go through a, a little bit of uh some of the more interesting things that have happened Okay, already then. <laughs> it's time for the news. <laughs> I forgot about that one. <laughs> it's all new, baby. I, I thought it, I thought I was cleared for takeoff after the <laughs> the dice sound. No, that was yeah. my ending of the yeah. to the table. Yeah. <laughs> I failed you. I failed you. I sh- I should have played the new sound. I mm-hmm. forgot. Well, you're cleared Any, now, sir. You're anywho, cleared now. Cleared for takeoff. Rock on. Yeah, so the first thing is, uh, you know, the convention season is, I think, at a close for the year. Because I, I want to say that Essen is usually the last one. So, you know, some of the cons start early out of the gate in the beginning of the year. You know, go through the summer, early fall, and then Essen usually beginning of October. I, I did think I heard something like next year is going to be later, but, um, yeah, Essen just happened, uh, just recently. What about two weeks ago, approximately. And they set a record, which is pretty cool. They sold out of badges, uh, for the first time. And I believe it's like a, a record for them because Last year, they had 193,000 visitors uh, that attended. And this year, it was 204,000 visitors. That's a lot. Now, one key thing is, and this has been like something that I've heard many times over the years, is that it's 2004 turnstile count, I believe. Yes. Because there's badge count, right? And then there's turnstile. So turnstile would be people walking in on the different days, right? I believe so. Right. Yeah. So like if you attend three days, then you get counted three times. Correct. But still, that's a lot. And it ran, I, it's it still ran not for four days. Accurate though. I don't. 
I still don't think that was right. I still don't like the way they count that. Like, you know, it Gen Con sold what seventy one thousand tickets this year, but badges, if they, yeah, badges, yeah, seventy one thousand badges. So if you multiply that times four, you got more than two hundred and four thousand people. Yeah, it, it's it's not it's not I think an accurate reflection of who how many people oh, actually were there. So the badge thing that does have its own caveat, right? Because it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's buying a four day. True. So no, right. You don't know if somebody's going once or if they're going four times or heck, even if they buy a four day badge, you know, they might only show up for one day. I mean, it doesn't matter. I don't know, but well, I think they should count like the person, like not, not they, I shouldn't be counted four times cause I went four days. Right. You know, I should be counted once I bought a ticket <laughs> and I just think that, that it should just be like, how many tickets did you sell? How yeah. many badges did you sell? That's what matters. Yeah. Not, I think, I feel like it's a way to beef up their numbers. You know, like if it sounds think about it, they could have sold the same amount of tickets this year compared to last year. But because last year was still, I think some people were still kind of unsure about big events from COVID. And now we're kind of like, whatever, you know, it, it pe- people are starting to return. So it could be that that's the reason. But I mean, I will say they did sell out. So they, they did have the most. But I just don't like the way they count. Because one person who does attend all the days gets counted multiple times. And I don't think that's, that's just not an accurate way. I think of, of counting. I, I don't know, but maybe they're looking at it in a different way for the, you know, it's probably like, well, for the vendors, we want you to know how many, you know, people total through the gate, but that's not, it, I'm not two, three or four people. If I well, come through that turnstile and if I go in in the morning and then I leave to go to lunch and then I come back now, I count as two people in the same day. Well, Maybe. I mean, it all depends on how they do the badges. Cause if you're going to Gen Con, you're wearing your badge. They're not scanning it or anything. I've, I've been to industry events where anytime you enter a room, you get like an RFID tag scan. So they meter you in and every, like in and out of every room. And that's also how you get your swag. <laughs> if you want your free t-shirt, let us scan you and then you'll be put on a email list. Mailing Here, put list, this under your phone skin. List. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Gen Con, they don't do any of that. Whereas, I mean, at Essen, I've never paid attention. Do you have to go through like a gate and get scanned? I mean, how do they, How I wonder how they count the turnstiles. I'll, I'll have to look it up. It's yeah, like I don't I said, know. We, we haven't yeah. been there, so. Yeah. Yet. One of these days. Oh, but I will say this. I will say this. I did hear a story this year that that? some, someone had purchased their airline tickets. They purchased hotel and they did not purchase the tickets to the event. And when they got there, just, they were sold out. They didn't get to go. So if you're going to go to a con especially, and you got to fly there and get a hotel, buy your tickets ahead of time because even Gen Con sold out all four days this year, this last year. Don't, Was, don't, don't not but buy they the sold badges. The, the four the day badges, going. right? They I remember, sold. I remember we saw the sold out. They were sold we out were all four days, it said. I thought it was the four day badges were sold out, but maybe they had individual days. I don't know. Okay. It does. It doesn't matter. Regardless, something is sold out. So don't, don't buy, don't book tickets and hotel and not buy the, before you even have tickets to the thing you're going to go to. That just seems insane. Get those first. Once you have your essence spiel or Gen Con tickets, then book flights and hotels. <laughs> just, so don't, don't be that person that flies across the country or across the ocean. World. Yeah. And to, to stand out there and cry 
because you didn't buy a ticket ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So things do sell out. So. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Although at that point, you could just go to like the cool stores that they have over there and just probably buy all the same stuff. (laughs) I don't like I don't think it's the same thing. I don't think that's going to work the same way. Yeah. It uh I wouldn't be happy to go to Indy and not get into Gen Con, but go to the one game store across the street and call <laughs> it good. Yeah, I'd be a little upset. Well, that's what you get for not buying your tickets. <laughs> exactly. So and it's not public available. Service announcement. Yeah, and it's not available by the scalpers. Apparently. Yeah. But um what I was gonna say was that they had uh like Toys R Us, I want to say, over in Europe, had like a full-on awesome game selection. I I doubt that they're over that they're there anymore because they probably folded when the U.S. ones folded. But you know, here in the U.S., they had you know shoots and ladders and all your typical games, and then over there they had like you know all the hobbyist games. It was good stuff. Anyway, so yeah, that, that was pretty interesting. It's cool to see that the hobby's growing and that uh, the cons that we enjoy so much are, you know, they're getting the attendance. You know, it stinks when you can't get a ticket because it's sold out. Yeah. That, that I get, but it's, uh, it's cool. And from the coverage that I've seen of Essen, it didn't, most people said it wasn't like super crowded. So even though they had what about, let's see about another 10,000, 11,000. Then, uh, you know, it still felt comfortable for most people there. I remember watching some of the live vlogs from the dice tower and there was times where i thought the same thing and at one of their vlogs they even made a comment like people were saying wow it doesn't look like anyone's there and and i think it was chris he was saying well it's because the doors aren't open yet like you know or it's the early the early group you know um the doors aren't completely open and then then later on he was like oh see you know and he was stuck in somewhere but it did look to me like there was a lot more room to move around. And I, I think that they've just got a bigger convention center, like a lot more floor space because things seem to be spaced out. At least it looks that way in the video. Like it, the, the booths are not as close together as they are at Gen Con. So I, I think yeah. that's kind of the reason why I, and there's multiple building. I know Gen Con's got multiple buildings as well, but Um, they, they, I know that they were talking about how they really kind of group things differently this year. So I don't know if they have like one, just one building as the retail hall, so to speak. seems like it's spread out a little bit better and that they have more room, but yeah, I I thought the same thing. I was like, Oh, that looks better. Like it's just not crowded. That's the problem with Gen Con. There's so many people. They're just bumping into you constantly. And I just, you want to throw punches and elbows, <laughs> <laughs> start headbutting the purple headed people. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, and it's, plus it's a mishmash of stuff. You know, everything's kind of mixed together. So, you know, you'll have like the booth that you're really interested in. And then, you know, you have the, you know, the steampunk clothing booth yeah. right next to it. <laughs> and then the jewelry, then the dice, then there's, yeah. like, you know, some, book signing thing going on you know yeah everybody likes their own thing right so i know that's yeah exactly some people's jam (laughs) but uh well yeah so next thing i thought was pretty cool was uh this just happened earlier this month where apparently barnes and noble purveyor of books and games and actually has a decent selection of games uh, is going to start listing game designers um, as part of the whole board game thing, their board game effort. Like, you know, that's a common thing with books, right? Yep. It's like who the... Who's the author? The, yeah, the author of it. And, you know, sometimes they'll list, you know, depending what it is, they'll list the artist 
and such. So I thought it was pretty cool that uh, they finally, after all these years, are going to start doing this. Apparently, this is uh, something that they're going to start because the Tabletop Game Designers Association, um, the TTGDA, uh, reached out to them and they're going to assist in uh, building this kind of like database and stuff like that for them. So that's kind of cool. So, you know, you can go over there and, you know, you can see Castles of Burgundy by Stefan Feld or, you know, Matthias Kramer or Klaus Jürgen Vrede or Reiner Knesia or, you know, insert designer here. And Elizabeth you know, some of the old, Yeah. Yeah. Some of the, you know, some of the notable ones out there, but heck even for, you know, people that are like new to designing games and, you know, they've got that hit that's, you know, uh, just going gangbusters out of the gate. It'll be cool to have their names out there. You know, it'll help people that aren't necessarily in the hobby to actually see like, Oh, you know, this game is by, um, Stefan Feld or something like that. Not that it'll mean anything to them. (laughs) Those names are definitely, they definitely mean a lot to us, but uh, I I thought that's pretty cool. So this shows that, you know, the board games are going to the next level where, you know, the designers might not mean something only to us, but to your your common folk, maybe they'll, uh, maybe they'll learn something uh, about that as well. Cause you know, most people, like when they go to buy board games, they don't even think about a designer, right? Right. And nobody knows who Monopoly is made by, like your, your normal person. Not that I Mattel. know. I know it's a woman <laughs> that did it. But yeah, <laughs> Milton Bradley or well, Brothers. Someone, something like that. Yeah, that's why, why is it board games have been the person who designs it's never gotten the recognition? But yeah. movies, you know who stars yep. in it. You know mm-hmm. who now you don't may not know who wrote it, but you know who directed it. And directors get like top billing on movies, and yeah. it's not like the studio, and it's not the publisher of the book, the the music. It's you know who the artist is of the music. You don't know maybe which studio or a uh, recording studio. You know, was it Geffen Records or Capitol Records or whatever? Mm-hmm. That's not front and center, but in board games, it, it's the publisher gets all the top billing. That just seems wrong. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad they're making this change. Oh yeah, no, that's that's pretty cool. That shows that you know the the hobby that we're in. These people that mean something to us, you know, maybe they'll get the notoriety, you know, amongst the commoners. Right. And then, uh, yeah, next up. I, I, this kind of came out of nowhere. It kind of shocked me a little bit. But uh, Stonemeyer Games, which uh, is the purveyor of many, many fine games, such as Viticulture and what's that bird one that you like? Wingspan. <laughs> what's that dragon one? <laughs> Wormspan. Wormspan. Apiary. And Scythe. And, and oh, yeah. Tapestry. Tapestry. Charterstone. And there's that one that came out in COVID that you like. You you bought the uh, oh Rolling Realms. Yeah, Rolling Realms that that add on or the sequel. The or Rolling something. Realms Redux. Yeah, yeah. So they acquired Tokaido uh, from Funforge, which is one of their like top top uh, brands, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Tokaido, but. That's a, it's a game that's been around a while and it's, uh, it's fun. It's, it's pretty cool. It's, uh, basically I I call it the Panda game. And, uh, there's like a whole bunch of versions of this that came out, including like this massive version, which had like, it was like a giant version that you could get just cause you know, you're a glutton for shelf space (laughs) (laughs) or or deleting your big box version. Yeah. And, uh, and they got a couple coming out, like, I guess, Takedo duos coming out. And, uh, they also came out with, uh, Namiji. I think that's how you play it or say it or, uh, Namiji. 
or something. Yeah, and anyway, I'm guessing it's Namiji, uh, which is the ship game, uh, which I have as well. And these these games are interesting because like they're all white and like their boxes and stuff like that. But uh, Takedo is an awesome little game, and Stonemeyer is picking them up. So, um, it's interesting to see when these companies sell off their you know, big properties. Like when Mayfair sold off Catan to Asmodee yeah. and then they fold it afterwards, you know, is it, is it like they're trying to save themselves? It's sort of like, you know, we'll sell off this, you know, IP so we can get an influx of cash and then what? So, you know, I hope Fun Forge is uh, going to be okay, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see that now Stonemeyer. Uh, is going to be running it and what they're going to do with it. Were, were you going to say something? No. No? Okay. And uh, yeah, yeah. if you folks haven't seen or played Takedo, definitely check it out. It's one of uh, Antoine Bowser's uh, uh, really good games that he's done. Uh, next up, Colt Express. This is a game that came out some time ago, and it was... Uh, I thought it was like so cool. It had this awesome table presence because it had like a cardboard train. So you would basically, you know how you Mark, you know how you like fit the, the the pieces together that you punch out. Like sometimes you might make a little chest or, you know, some kind of little box or something in in different games. Well, this one had a train uh, that you basically built and then you had these little meeples that would be like on top of the train and moving from car to car and stuff like that. It was, yeah. it was pretty cool. And uh, so they're coming out with a 10th anniversary big box <laughs> edition. Always why the not? big box. Because <laughs> why not? Yeah, it's getting into retail next month. Because, uh, you know, it's it's just an awesome thing to buy a whole game again. <laughs> yeah, especially... If, if you've got expansions and stuff like that, but there is an appeal to have everything all together in one box. I gotta say. So yeah, this, uh, the big, the big box edition has the base game, the Marshall and prisoner expansions, the horse and stagecoach expansion, uh, an additional bandit named silk. And then uh, everything fitting into one huge anniversary big box uh, edition playing two to nine players. Oh, wow. Yeah. Two to nine. Yeah. Two to nine. So uh, that's, uh, hey, if you're looking, though, did you order it yet? <laughs> I was going to say, because <laughs> I know you were looking for games that play more people. But he uh, was like, wow, two to nine. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> Got excited there. But yeah, it, and it's going to be retailing for 50 bucks. So that's, uh, that's not bad. That's not bad. And then uh, next up uh, is there was a, um, there was a guy at Spiel that, at Essen, that actually had this not a guy, a designer. I should be more accurate with that. He had three games released at the same time. Uh, that was uh, Thomas Holek. And I always think it's fascinating. Like, like, you know, you're a game designer, you know, you're trying to get your games, um, you know, picked up by all these publishers. And then, you know, you sell different games to different publishers and they all come out at the same time. Like a couple of years ago for, what was it? For the SDJ, uh, Wolfgang Warsh had like two or three games. Um, I, and I could have sworn he was like competing against himself, if I remember right. <laughs> like, I like suppose he, that could happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's just a matter of like, you know, publishing schedules. And I saw an interview with him for uh, this year. And yeah, he was saying that, you know, he was pushing the games out and, you know, publishers would pick him up and they're like, yeah, we can't publish them until like 2024. And, you know, then there's this collision 
So uh, one of the games uh, that he did that, uh, you know, did get some uh, good press and stuff like that was Galileo Galilei. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned his name. Did I mention his name? You did. Okay. Thomas Holuck. Yeah. I was, I was too busy. I was too busy yapping. <laughs> uh, but uh, let me see. I know T. It's like Tea Party or something like that was one of his other ones. No, oh, so he did SETI. Oh, really? Search for extraterrestrial intelligence. He did Galileo, Galilei, Tea Garden, not Tea Party. So those were his three releases. And, uh, you know, SETI is a uh, you know, game by uh, Czech Games Edition, CGE. And uh, I think it's like officially out now. Because I don't think it was out at Gen Con. No, it was to be released in yeah. um, Essen. So, yeah. And I think they sold, I saw an article, they sold like 3,000 copies at Essen. Wow. So it's, it's on its way to retail. So, okay. I've got that one pre-ordered. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. Say, I, thought, I thought you said so. Yeah. Well, uh, Galileo got picked up by, who was it? Um, Capstone games. So Capstone games is teaming up with pink Troubadour. So Capstone is going to bring it to the United States in looks like, uh, the first half of next year, Q2 specifically. So, uh, we should get it, uh, before summer. So we'll probably be seeing this over at Gen Con for sure. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if, uh, tea garden, I don't know, I don't know if that one got picked up. Let me hmm. just check that one real quick. And. Yeah, it looks like uh Yeah, it's going to be sold under a huck looks like. I don't know if that's going to be in the US, but uh availability, general availability at least in Germany if not in the US is going to be April 2025. And what's funny is I just looking on BGG and they already have, uh, they already have like inserts. Like you can 3d print your inserts already. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, for those that can get it already in Europe, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So yeah, uh, Tomas Holek. He's uh, one of the hotter designers of uh, of Essen. So I, I'm actually looking forward to SETI and Galileo. Um, I saw Tea Garden. It looks interesting, um, but uh, I'm more excited in the other two. That's just me. Yeah, SETI, I did a, a two-hour oh, demo. I remember, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I walked away, I remember I told you and Franco, it's like, yeah, I'm not going to get that game. It was something I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, it's, it's too, it's too heavy. It's, it's not for me. But as I've started to progress my into heavier games, it's one, it was like, I really was interested in it. Even playing it. It's like, there is, I want to learn how to play this, but I just felt, ah, it's too much. But I decided I'm going to push myself on this and mm -hmm. I'm going to pre-order this. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to, cause I, I want to, it looks really cool. And yeah. I just think it was a little overwhelming at, you know, trying to do a demo on a, on a heavy game. It's is, so hard to hear hard. too, you know? Yes. Yes. It, even in that yeah. room, it was just so, there was so much going on and what was it in the CGE room or was it in the big hall? It was in the CG room, which was better, yeah. but there was so many tables around you of all these different stuff and people walking through. It's, mm -hmm. it's still loud. So it was hard to follow. Yeah. But 
I well, I ordered it, so we'll we'll see. Yeah. yeah, I'll be I'll be picking up both of those for sure. I'm a I'm a sucker for CGE games. I'm uh, not sad to admit. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so another game that does multiple people, I don't know if I would recommend this one for, <laughs> for you to bring to your game group, is uh, Diplomacy. So there's uh, uh, a game coming out by Renegade called Diplomacy, Era of Empire. So it's a standalone game of... Uh, are you familiar with diplomacy at all? I am not. Diplomacy is a game that will ruin friendships. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a good way to put it. <laughs> ruin friendships, ruin marriages. Um, it is about diplomacy or lack of, <laughs> I don't know which way you want to look at it, but yeah, in this game, uh, players assume the control of seven great empires britain uh french russian turkish chinese japanese and uh the netherlands actually how would you say that would that be i don't know would that be the dutch empire i, I don't know anyway uh it's basically the diplomacy game engine uh, in a different standalone game and it's two to seven players. So you can ruin friendships with up to six other people. <laughs> nice. The only gotcha is diplomacy takes a long time to play. Uh, this has a four hour play time. Oof, that counts yeah. us out. Yeah. So yeah, when you're, when you're playing, game nights it's like one and done with this one yeah <laughs> but that's 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 probably fine because everybody's going to be storming out <laughs> <laughs> it's like you hurt my feeling table flipping feelings, involved in both this. of them yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and uh uh we talked about renegade a bunch of times here but uh another thing from renegade is that they re-released HeroScape, and I want to say we mentioned that last show or maybe the show before. I forget. Actually, no, it was last show because uh, I think I was talking about that because uh, it's one of the few games that I have from not necessarily my youth, but that I had from before I really got full on big time into the hobby again. But uh, so HeroScape was out for some time and then it got put out to pasture. A lot of people were complaining and man, it went on a hiatus for like 10 years. Was it like 10 years? And then Renegade picked up the rights to it and brought it back and they fully sold out of wave one of this and i want to say it came out last year sometime but uh yeah it's fully sold out apparently everywhere and uh you know we're probably waiting on wave two maybe it's in containers or something like that i i don't know anything i'm not saying rumor or anything like that i'm just speculating because you know that's how it works Insider. right <laughs> yeah you know the the company sells out so they pick up the phone or they pick up the Skype or Zoom <laughs> or whatever. Do people use Skype anymore? I don't think so. They they pick up the Teams. Zoom. Yeah. And, Teams uh, and Zoom. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, they get a hold of the factory. Give us more. And then three months later, the uh, shipping containers are unloaded. <laughs> but uh, there's a whole ton of stuff that they're coming out with. So HeroScape had like base sets so it's got like little terrain tiles it's got the dudes like the different characters dragons creatures whatever and um you could buy all these like add-ons which give you like additional terrain so like people had huge totes like rubbermaid containers filled with stuff 
Hmm. for these games. And, you know, you would build out certain campaigns that told you like what to use and stuff like that. So there's like a master set that's out and a couple other things where they're full on releasing a whole bunch of things. Like there's a hero scape paint set. So, I mean, I don't know why you exactly need a hero scape one, but you know, maybe it's uh, the particular colors, right. That the game uses. So it's an army painter paint set. And what was it? They came out with, there's a couple of things here, a bunch of expansions, 12 army expansions are coming out approximately $35 to $45 MSRPs on all of these. And so these are going to be releasing in first and second quarter, 2025. And there's a couple of terrain expansions that are coming out. Uh, the snow fields of Valhalla. So, you know, think white tiles with, you know, a snow ice look to them and everything. And then there's, uh, the swamps of Valhalla. So, uh, each of these sets have a $60 retail again, coming out, uh, next year. So I bet a lot of people are really stoked for all this stuff and, if they don't have the base sets, you know, already, hopefully, you know, they'll come out with, um, like a new wave of the master sets and stuff like that. So I would imagine if all this stuff comes out first and second quarter, that's probably when we're going to see wave two. Again, I don't know anything about this. I'm not, I'm just speculating. I'm just <laughs> a guy wondering like what makes sense and, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to happen. And then uh, two other quick things. Uh, Devere came out with White Castle uh, a while ago, which is a, it's a pretty cool little game. What they had, White Castle, they had, it was like three games or something like Sands, something. Anyway, um, a White Castle was a big hit of theirs and they're coming out with a new expansion. So I'm interested to see what uh, this one's going to be like. Uh, apparently this one's going to be in retail here in the next couple weeks. So we'll see it before the holidays. And then uh, lastly, I, I thought this would be cool to talk about because, you know, you and I, we have a long history of Xbox gaming and uh, you know, there's been some halo games that have come out um, over the, never heard of it over the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like hollow infinite <laughs> yeah Remember from back in the day so yeah halo flashpoint um came out from mantic games and they're another one that's like they're coming out with a painting kit why yeah. not so another army painter one so army painter is you know getting together with these different manufacturers and coming out with painting kits so you can get uh the perfect colors for your Spartans and stuff. So I thought that was pretty cool. $50 retail. Um, but you know, I suppose you could always do your own thing. And I think uh, it's good that they've got like the official colors, uh, mm -hmm. for these games. I think that's cool. Cause those are the people that paint and really get into them. I mean, that's a big thing, you know, especially being authentic and having, having the right colors. It's, it's, so it's nice to see it like officially, Available. Yeah. Oh heck yeah. Yeah, so this thing comes with you get your paints. Looks like what about like six or eight paints, maybe? And an army painter paintbrush. Oh, and it comes with a master chief model and two game cards. So yeah, there's a little something extra in here. That's pretty cool. Yeah. More than just the paint and a yeah. model to use in the game. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it for the news and cool stuff uh, over the past uh, week or two. So 
I'm I'm waiting for you to play something. Are, are you gonna play I, something? <laughs> dun dun dun. <laughs> da, 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 da. Topic of the day. <laughs> <laughs> roll, come on, roll your dice. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me get that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that'd so be funny. funny. The one single dice. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and then you're doing like da da da, like the big. Like symphony <laughs> style noise, and you get the <laughs> clink, clink, clink. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. Anyway, anywho, anywho. So, games come in so many different sizes, forms, shapes, and everything associated with that. So. We can easily lump games into huge, huge, huge productions. Like we were talking about Cloudspire just as the show started, right before the show started. How much was that all in? Oh, almost $700. Yeah. Sprawling. (laughs) <laughs> on your table or tables, <laughs> right? I mean, there's some games out there where they like can't fit on your table. Yeah. You know, it's like you sprawl that game out, like Arc Nova, for example, you know, not even something like, like super crazy, but you know, there's no room for you to put your stuff down. Like there's no room for your player stuff. And on the flip side, you have tiny games like Love Letter. Was it like 20 some cards? Or there's some that even have less cards. Yeah, wasn't it Button Shy, I think? The 16 yeah. games that have 16 cards in it and that's it? Mm-hmm. I think it's them. Yeah. And... I don't know. I thought it'd be interesting to talk about like the pros and cons of different sized games because, you know, we all love these big productions. Well, I don't know if everybody does. I sure do. And, but yeah. there's a price to pay for those. Literally. <laughs> more more than one. There, there, <laughs> yeah. There's the, the actual price of the game, which does cost a yeah. fortune. Um, the the mm-hmm. bigger they are, the the definite price tag increase. Um, but, and, and even sometimes like too many bones is not a huge box, but it's a heavy box because of the components and the super high quality poker chips and stuff in there. Just neoprene mats, things like that, that just are, you know, weigh it down and, and create a massive price tag on that thing too. But you also have to pay the price of set up or clean up <laughs> or I should say, and a clean up, which can mm-hmm. be time consuming. Oh um, yeah. So those bigger games, um, I, there's games that it's like, okay, if I know we're going to play this, I'll show up at least a half an hour early, sometimes more so that I can have it set up and ready to go right at six o'clock when people start coming in. Yeah. Because if you wait and show up, then you're not going to get started till, you know, close to an hour later. Mm -hmm. And if it's a big game, it's going to take some time. And if you have a group that meets at a location that does close, you don't have a choice but to pack up and leave. Yeah. So, and like our, our, our place closes at 10. If I've got a massive game, it's going to take me 15, 20 minutes to pack up. I can't wait till 10 o'clock to start packing right. up. You have well, to start packing up before then. <laughs> You're not going to be welcome back. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. what, people yeah. are, those people want to leave. <laughs> yeah. But, they're not enjoying your gaming session as much as you are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, for sure. And, you know, one thing too, about the large games is I, I don't know if you have this. I don't know if it's a problem. <laughs> Maybe it's my problem. I don't know. But if it's a large game, I'll tend to want to get like an organizer for it or something. 
Do you, you know what I mean? It's like the box inserts or oh, like yeah. they have the speed play inserts where it's organized in such a way. All you do is you pull out all this stuff, right? And then it's ready. Oh, you know, that's nice. every, everything's in its own little compartment and it's like you put out the board put these couple compartments over here everybody gets their own little box which might be their their player stuff and so some of these do speed up the setup but for large games if it takes you 45 minutes to set it up man it's cutting into your game time well it's like i i've never played twilight imperium but Mm -hmm. one of the comments made uh, the other night at the group was one guy said, well, I could bring Twilight Imperium and I could probably have it set up by 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty much right on. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, the, that's kind of uh, the big games there. There is a pretty. They can have some really bad effects to it. Things like Gloomhaven, you know we were playing a campaign of that and the the lady whose house we were playing at, you know, she had to keep this thing out. That's a huge box. There's a lot in it, you know, and then, you know, if you keep this thing out, something like that, that's going to take you um, a year to two to play through. Um, unless you were able to somehow sit down and go all the way through it, which I don't think is possible. I know that the brothers Murph did it, but I think they were doing something like three straight days of playing. And, oh, wow. um, uh, hold, hold on one second. Holding. Okay. I'm back. Sorry. That was no worries. <laughs> um, anyways, children, <laughs> let me just say that kids, yeah. Uh, the, the bad thing about having such a large game is that uh, not only the time to set up, the time to play it. So if you got something like Gloomhaven that's going to take, you know, 200 plus hours, it's not something you're going to be able to, you know, how do you keep that game out? Now, something like this is, again, you you do scenarios and then you every scenario you're resetting. So there's a lot of setup in between, cleanup and setup in between each scenario. Um, so you might only be doing a couple scenarios at a, at a game session, but there's still a lot of components at big box. You're going to pack it all away and then go put it on the shelf, you know, and then have to mm-hmm. dig it back out again later. Um, you know, that is a thing. Then there's also some of these games are so large that do you even have a table big enough? Um, at our, at our place where we play, we've got tables that are, you know, seat six people, and there's times we're like struggling, like this is, you know, how are we going to fit all this on here? Yeah. And mm-hmm. they do have bigger tables, but then it's like, they're, they're, they're so big. It's like, you can't even shake the hand of the person across from you. Um, you know, but then do you want to set up like that? Then it can be hard to reach stuff because the tables are so much larger. So it's trying to have a good table size that everyone can see and read and reach what they need to. Um, those can be bad too, mm-hmm. but those can also but. be some pretty epic gaming experiences. Yes. You know, so it's not all bad. I mean, there are no, good no. things as well. Like, you know, um, just the, with my Gloomhaven playthrough, the, we didn't get to do it all. We haven't completed it. I don't know if we'll get back, but we played a lot of it. And it was like the abilities to build up your characters and to, to change, even change characters at a certain time, you can retire them and get a new character and, and to learn a new one and go through this, the story and everyone's working towards goals. And, you know, those are some really cool moments in gaming that you don't get from like Monopoly, you know? Um, And so the little games I think have their place. The big games have their place. Um, little games are great for like, you know, just if you're going to, if you, if you commute, you know, maybe you can take something that you can play on the train, you know, um, sure. or, you know, if you're in a, if you're taking a train to, to work um, or some people will take something small, they can 
put in their their purse, their backpack, whatever, and play it at lunchtime at their desk. Or, you know, or uh, even if you get a group after work, you can take a small game and everyone hangs out and plays a game after work or something. The smaller games are great for those types of things. If you're traveling, if you're going on vacation, you know, you can pack a bunch of smaller games in a, in a small, you know, bag or a box or something and take with you so that right. you can still take your games with. Um, but, you know, then you run into player counts and things like that, that uh, all these different types of games to limit. And that's one of the things you mentioned earlier that, uh, and we were talking about it just this week. Um, one of the games we want to play next week is Ark Nova. And one of the guys was like, yeah, but it only plays four. And I'm like, I know that's like, that's such the problem of trying to find games for a group. Cause you're, you wanting to try to hit that magic player count of like six to be able to accommodate over, you know, at least six. Cause more than that, then it's like, we can't, can't really fit more than six around the table. Then we like to break up, but it's, it's harder to, always seems like if you only have five people show up and you can't play a four player game and then you really, what are you going to do? Get two four player games and have a group of three and one of two, you know, it, yes. it's, it's tough, but it's tough to do that. Having a four player game that plays best at four with only two people. Sometimes that doesn't work so great. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like games with three. That's, that's like my sweet spot, but yeah, the big games, they tend to take too long. I'm sorry, with the big player count games. That, yeah, I would, uh, I've played six player Lords of Waterdeep and uh, you can be sitting there for a while between your turns, especially if you got one or more people that have analysis paralysis. Yep. That it's just like, just move. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have like, a timer a 30 second I, move timer <laughs> you know there's times where i'm sitting there and it's like well okay so i did my turn i'm like i'm gonna go run up and get a coke refill or grab a snack or something and then i get back and it's like i didn't plan my move and it's oh now it's your turn and i'll sit there's like crap you know um i don't want to hold people up but i start to be like i'm taking too much time i'm taking too much time i'll just do this you know right i do that all the time yeah yeah, because it's, it's like, like I don't want to. Right. Yeah, I'm like, it doesn't matter. I want to have fun. I want everyone else to have fun. Mm -hmm. I can care less if I win. You know, um, I just don't want to be the person that's holding everybody else up because I know how I feel when exactly. I'm sitting there and that person yeah. is just, I'm like, take your turn. You're aware of it. Yeah. And it's like, or they've already, they've done their turn. Never mind. That's going to go mm -hmm. in a different category. Never mind. Sure. Not even going to go there. That, that's another topic for another. Yes, day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you're right. Too many players can make a a, a shorter game drag on. Yeah, like I played so. at Gen Con in the game library. Uh, we had a six player Game of Thrones game going. I want to say it took like five hours. Ooh. It was like, for me, it was torture and my phone, my phone went dead like halfway through. So <laughs> I had, I had my phone on the charger and there was like, it was a bunch of people that joined, that joined us. So, uh, it was myself and, uh, the, the former co-host Jeff, um, uh, you, you know, Jeff, uh, that, yep. uh, like we were there and then four people that just walked up and started playing with us. So, you know, there's a bunch of people that were like min maxing and you know, doing AP and stuff like that. And it just like, if, if I'm sitting there for like 10 minutes waiting for my turn, cause like somebody's like talking over like every move that they can make. It's like, Oh, well, if you do this, I do this. And then, but you'll do that, which will put him at an advantage. It's like, Oh, Please, please yeah. take your turn. <laughs> All right, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going yeah. to the mall. I'm I'm going to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> See yep. you guys. But uh yeah. Someone can play for me. <laughs> I don't yeah. care. Put a bot in my plays. <laughs> yep. Don't want to ruin the game, yeah. but I can no longer sit here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's frustrating when you know you're sitting there for 10 or 15 minutes and it gets to you and you're like, you're ready. 
I'm like, okay, boom. Mm-hmm. You know, you spend one minute doing your turn and then you're going to sit there for another 15, 20 minutes before it gets back to you. Yeah. It's like when others are playing, that's where you just start figuring out what you want to do. Right. Especially in a large player count. You, you got to be ready to go. Now, some yeah. games it's tough to do because the type of game might be where everything is changing and you really can't decide. It's hard. Until the, right. Until the player right before you finishes because you may not even know what the board or what's you know Mm -hmm. there's several games i've played where it's like you can't you can't really plan ahead um but those they're not that complicated of a game that it should take you a long time to figure out what your next move Mm -hmm. is yep you know so got people got to keep it moving man no matter what the player count is you know If it's a oh, two player, sure. man, it shouldn't be my turns one minute, yours is ten. Like, come on. Exactly. I'm yeah. gonna I'm it's you know, uneven. It, it's uneven. Yeah, exactly. It's not being like, courteous. And it's like if you care that much to win, then I'm not gonna play. Like if it's that so important to you, you're not gonna have me to play against anymore. Cause I I just wanna play the game. I just wanna have fun, not sit here and have you stressed out. How am I gonna kill him? How am I gonna destroy him? I must win. Yeah. Like, really just play. I must have all the points. Yeah. (laughs) They are all mine. All your points are belong to us. (laughs) So then how about little games? So, you know, first, so for this topic, there's, there's really two big littles, right? So there's big size, little size, big player count, little player count. So just focusing on like size of the games. Like, what are your thoughts on little games that take up very little table presence? Like maybe something like no thanks, right? That takes up very little table space. Uh, Well, you do get your tableaus in front of you. Yeah, but it's still not, you know, that's still not a whole lot, but um, yeah, things like no thanks. Is that more card games you think that are the little games? You know, well, I think it probably traditionally there's a lot more card games that fit into that uh, because even something small like Mountain Goats still takes up a good amount of table space because you got to put all those you you know, build spaces your out. You got to build your mountain, right? Right. Um, so that still takes up a good amount of space. Um, dice chuckers can be small space, like games like Quicks sure. where it's just you're just rolling dice and writing on your pad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, some roll and writes um, are small table space that are just phenomenal and excellent. You know, it, it doesn't have to be this massive, like the table space doesn't translate to fun. And I do feel like those, those games well, can sometimes move on, quicker on Kickstarter <laughs> <laughs> table presence translates into fun. <laughs> That's called PR. <laughs> yeah. Or or I'm sorry, not PR, but um marketing, marketing. spin. Marketing. Yeah. 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 Funded in eight minutes. <laughs> so you you had a goal of one dollar, like your first yeah. person funded it. Like exactly. that doesn't make it a great game. <laughs> so but yeah, I mean, I, I I really do enjoy I enjoy a good mix of stuff. I I think I would get burned out if I'm always playing heavy games. It's you've got to yeah. have like a palate cleanser. You got to have that small game to kind of like, ah, oh, okay. It's like drinking the water, you know, after you eat a jalapeno or something or something spicy. Or you got to cleanse that palate, you know, reset. And I like the sometimes the smaller games because it it's not intimidating. They're usually a lot easier to pick up and learn. You can usually get rid of that there's not as much of that analysis paralysis going on typically because there's not eight million different things you could do right you know there's there's i think a lot less strategy and it's just more you know maybe luck based um but it just it's fun so but i I like a good mix of stuff i think my favorite um and i'm going off this is kind of out i guess i'm sidetracking but a medium weight game I think is my favorite because I think it fits into there's a little bit of 
there, it, it's a small game that has a little bit more to it, but it's not a heavyweight game that just right. like hurts my brain. And I'm like, well, I could go here and get this, or I can go there and I get this. But then like, what's it mean? Three moves in front. It's like, ah, I can't take it. You know, a small game, just like, like something like Tapple. We played Tapple the other day. It's a quick, it's fast. You're just, you're, you're naming, a, you know, you pull a card and there's a topic and you're just trying to, you know, you're going around the table and someone's got to think of something, you know, might say fruit. And so you have all these letters on this thing that, and it's clicking, tick, 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 tick. You got like 10 seconds. So you got to press down like the S and say uh, strawberry, right? And then you hit the hand in the middle to reset the timer and the next person gets 10 seconds to, now the S is gone. You can't say a fruit that starts with S. You got to say one that starts with another letter on the wheel that hasn't been pressed. You know, it's extremely simple for anybody to learn immediately. And it gets crazy because you're just like, ah, you can't repeat what someone said. You, you know, you're trying to, and it's like your brain will just be like, I can't think of any fruit. I don't know what a fruit is. You know, <laughs> um, you get into yeah. that like fun party panic mode and those can be just great. Um, but it's also fun to have more where you're, you add a little bit more than that. You you, prog you progress past the the party games, which I think I love party games. I, I do. I love code names and things like just one. And, you know, those are, are really fun party games, but it's also great to have to kind of move, move beyond the small game and go into that kind of medium weight where you're, 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 you're not having that eight hour or 200 hour campaign your game might take you two hours. Um, you know, somewhere between that hour to two hour mark, I think is great. And um, learning new mechanics and even like Finca is a small box, the, the new one anyway. Oh yeah. Very and small. there's, it still has a, a good table presence. It looks interesting on the table, but it's not huge. You can set it up fairly quick um, and it's pretty quick to, and easy to learn. But it starts you to get kind of it slows down where party games, I think, are usually quick and fast paced. And, you know, sometimes it's nice to do that. But then again, mix it up with something that is give me a little bit more time to think and look at things. And and that one's not overly crazy because you can look at what people have and I'll sit there and I'll look, OK, if I take that tile, it's going to give the bonus now. And the bonus is who sold the most grapes. And I'm looking around the table counting everyone's grapes. Okay, I am tied with that person. So I don't want to take that one yet. So I need to get another grape before that one comes available so I can get the bonus. You know, it's I can it's like I can do that. You, you just know? gave me your strategy. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, you know, it's just like I like that where it starts to give you a little bit more of a uh, um, a little strategy or a little bit of thinking, but you're not playing arcs or twilight Imperium yeah. or, you know, whatever these, you know, even brass Birmingham was like, ouch, you know, Oh yeah. It hurt my yeah. brain to play. And <laughs> no, the, the, especially something like brass first time you play like brass London, any of those Martin Wallace games in particular, first time you play them, not that it's rough going, but, it's like you don't get it and those you really need to play multiple times for them to really shine yep. then they're like yes i see the love i i see why yeah so were you gonna say something well, else? well i was thinking yeah that's right because like like i've played brass once brass birmingham i and i want to play it again i played arcs once it's like i i feel like i don't necessarily want to play it again i think i need to play it again <laughs> <laughs> to to before i make a judgment but it's there's like, things why like why does what does everybody see in this game <laughs> i think what's weird yeah. is like i'm not yet to that point of right. where the heavy games I'm, I'm that's why i'm like a medium game medium weight yeah. person for me um, and I know this is, I think, getting a little off topic. Sorry about that. But no, it's, okay. it's um, I like when I play a game like with Hadrian's Wall, there's a lot there that I still don't know. Right. But I immediately like fell in love with the game. 
Like, this is great. You know, and, and, and that one even is probably pushing, I don't know, what do they rate that one? I got that up on my screen. That's rated at 3.16. So it is a medium to heavy weight pen paper game, um, which I'd agree. But it, there was enough there. And I have a familiarity with like these pen paper games, chaining things that it, it was easier to pick up. Um, and I just immediately fell in love with it, but something like arcs or brass Birmingham, it's like, you know, these heavy games, it's like, I, I don't, I, you can't, maybe some people can, who are very experienced gamers, but someone who might like myself, I, I got to play this a couple more times. Cause like, I just don't get it, you know, but then things like Orleans, I, I liked it after one play. So it, it's it's weird how some you know, I think and I don't know what Orleans is weighted. I'll have to look that up. But um, I would say that's like a medium weight. It's not like see if it's, a light one for sure. That's three three point oh three. So, but still, yeah. like the first time I played it, there was just like so many different things going on. But it was one I think I could. It was easier to kind of grasp and go. Okay, I like this, and I like all these different things, and I want to. I want to play this one again. And I have, um, but something, some, some of these really big ones are just like, like, Oh, what's that one that are just, they're so in depth that it's like, I don't know if I'll ever like it. Um, Oh, it's a, uh, (laughs) I I am worried about SETI. It's like, it's heavy, but the, I, it, it, the theme interests me and the production of the game, interests me so much that I'm like, I really want to learn this game. Right. And so no, but it's it. going to take me several times to really, okay, I'm getting this. I kind of got, I got an idea how to play this. Um, I can't think of the one. Oh, Kanban EV. Now, I've played that one a couple of times and man, okay. I'm just like, uh, I can't think of who, who it is. Is the that tall? Lacerda? Yeah. Yeah. Tall. Man, I, I just don't think I'm a Batal Lacerda fan because his game seems so hard um and the guy that brings it and plays it all the time he loves it and i'm just like i just you know i don't think that's for me you know um and it's one of those that just it takes a long time to play i think two hours is my happy spot and that's another thing too between like a big game and a little game is the length of time it takes to play because if it's if it's too short, sometimes it feels like, oh, I was just getting started. Right. You know, oh, I was just but sometimes those small games are perfect. They they just you you kind of expect it to be a quick and sometimes it's nice to have a, a game that maybe just lasts 10 to 15 minutes. You're just doing a warm-up, getting the brain thinking, you're waiting for all the gamers to show up, or you're gonna do a, a an end of the night. All right, we just did uh we just did arcs where our brain is burnt. Let's play something real quick, you know just to have a little fun, a light fun, you know, um, even a medium weight game. If it's, if it starts to drag on, then it's like, this just, is no more, this isn't fun anymore. And that's where, like I was mentioning earlier, the Lords of Waterdeep at six players, um, or even sometimes like a clank at six players. Cause I've, I got the expansion. So I'm usually, you know, I can play that up to six. It can start to start to drag. Or just kind of like, yeah, we should have kept this at three or four players, you know? Yeah. Um, there's so many things that kind of come into both good and bad mm-hmm. on big and little games and time, table space, player count. Just, yeah. Yeah, I just looked up Kanban EV. That's a 4.3. Oof. Oof. Probably, the, probably the hardest one I've played. It's, it's, um, it's not bad, but I've played it, I think twice now. And, you know, well, the guy that has the game too, he likes the bigger stuff like power sure. grid and, oh, yeah. um, that's classic game. Yeah. And, and power grid's okay. I don't mind. It's not, a, it, to me, it's not as hard as a, uh, Kanban, but, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think I did better the first time I played Kanban and then the second time I did a lot worse. I was just like, what happened? Like, I just, <laughs> it's like, I should have been better the second time around. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what's my sure name? Feel that way. Who am I? 
Yeah. So I don't know. I don't even was it. It just I think it all depends. It all comes down to the person, what what they like, what the group is like, where you're playing at, what you have space for, what you have time for. <laughs> Mm-hmm. What's the environment that you're in? <laughs> Are you in a quiet home environment where you can leave the game on the table for weeks to come? <laughs> or are you in a noisy gaming cafe or yeah. you know, you can't hear each other and maybe a shorter party game is better. You can be louder than everyone else. I don't know. <laughs> well, what do you prefer? Mention, I was gonna mention like I think when you play those heavier games. The three player sweet spot is probably ideal, you know, because then you're not sitting around forever. It's not as much complexity and, you know, it's easier to absorb the game. Once you know it, maybe go into higher player counts like four or if the game supports at five, six, you know, that might be better. Or that might be okay then. Yeah. But yeah, I was just thinking like maybe a learning game is, you know, is there a sweet spot for a learning game? And I just looked up the original Kanban. That one is a 4.3. That's not much easier <laughs> <laughs> on the, on the weight scale. But wait, what was your question just now? I just was wondering what you preferred. I rambled for a long time. I'm so sorry. We preferred uh, in, in terms like of like the big like and smaller. Oh, um, so you know, we'll we'll kind of like you know, I'll talk about like the weight of the games in particular, um, and then you know that can delve into the different sizes as well, but. Uh, I like starting out the game night with the lighter games. I always have, you know, like play something quick. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to play something like super simple, like a trick taking game. No, thanks. You know, something like that where it's like a 10 minute game. It doesn't have to be that, but it's just something lighter that is then like a good segue into something a little more substantial. Yeah. And when I say substantial, that could be one of many things. It could be, um, you know, doing a couple of medium weight games or do, doing a medium weight and then a heavy game, you know, because I find it's really difficult in terms of time to get in like, like a mega big game like a mega mega big production or especially to play two. Those are the ones where, you know, I've gone to some game nights where you get there and then you're going to play two big games and everybody's leaving at like three in the morning. You know, it just, it just takes too long, which is fine. If, if that's the goal, right. If the goal is like, Hey, this is the game night. We're just going to play until we can't play no more. If that's the case, it's fine. But if you got to go to work the next day or you got yeah, got to take kids yeah. to sporting events and stuff, then it's like, oh, shoot me. It's like going, you feel like you just went to the club <laughs> and you yeah. almost feel hungover. You just didn't drink anything. But uh, no, but uh, yeah, like I, I really enjoy starting off light and And there's been a lot of times where we would, you know, play a light game then play a heavy game and then finish off with something like a, like a quick little card game, like stickle or something like that. Stickle, I think is the, I think it's supposed to put a sh, not us at the beginning of that. But anyway, um, and one thing that, One thing that I I kind of have been thinking about when I was actually bringing this topic up was there's sometimes where it's like if if a game doesn't have that table presence, though, 
it's like not as inviting, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. It's like there's some games, like especially when you see them, and if it's just if they just like look plain, they look small, like you know, like like an old game from the '80s or something. You know, it it just looks so basic. You know, the cards are you know just black and white or something, and <laughs> very simple no art on them or if they have clip art or something like that, you know, it's just not as appealing, but lots of times when you do play those games are still fine. Anyway, like there's a great game innovation, which it's got clip art style art on it, but the game is amazing. So it's not something you should really judge, but I'm less drawn to the games that have like very extremely basic table presence which is interesting so let me take this uh i don't know maybe like in the, in the final direction player count big and little so on the little aspect of it the absolute little less is solo and those are entertaining. You know, there's a bunch of games that are exclusively solo games. Like a lot of the Oniverse games, like Onirim and all the Final ones Girl. that followed it. Final Girl, uh, Under Falling Skies, Friday, excellent card game from Freedom on Freeze. You know, that uh that is on the low side. And then you have you know, games with multiple players, right? That do like heck, um, werewolf, right? That can accommodate a ton of ton of people. Or uh, we mentioned it earlier, Cult Express, up to nine. So those are cool because they involve everybody in the group, right? Mm. Yeah, maybe. They come across as party games or whatever, but there's also a negative to that <laughs> because if it's an actual game with nine players, you're now, you're now playing a game. that's going to take you two months to finish <laughs> mm. that, that one game because <laughs> everybody's taken forever. Like you've played a bunch of the solos, right? What are your thoughts on those? Um, like the solo the, games, like under falling skies, final girl, like, yeah, I like, I enjoy, like, I really enjoyed final, final girl. There was another one I was trying to think of that I was playing solo for a while. Um, oh, I, I think I was playing too many bones in the solo. That's, that's tough to do. Um, don't, I don't recommend it. Um, but, uh, I, they can be fun depending on, the game i think if it's designed around that then i think it's okay um i haven't done like like a wingspan or a worm span that has the automata yeah i haven't done those and i think that can still be okay um as I'm i've done them on, on hea yeah. i've done like like the draft and write i've done that online sure against a, 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 you know, solo, but you're against an AI and that that's okay. Um, but I think the games that are specifically designed for solo play, I think are better. I, yes. I enjoy those because when you're trying to take a multiplayer game and add on a solo mode, I sometimes think that just doesn't necessarily work because it's like, I want to play against other people. You know, it's, it's, that's the way the game was designed. Um, the 20 strong games I think are good. Um, because you know, yeah, that's, yeah, those, those can be great. And I do enjoy those solo plays. Cause there's some games where, you know, there'll be like two to four player games and then they'll tack on the five and six player expansion. Right. And then the solo mode, right. They're usually like kickstart. If it's a Kickstarter, they're like, um, stretch goals, or they might come out as an expansion after the fact. And, you know, sometimes I wonder about those games because it's like, okay, you're, 
you're shoehorning this single player aspect into a game that's really not made for it. And all you're doing is you created a system to do like a bot, right? Yeah. Where it's like, oh, there's an there's another player called Fred. You know, <laughs> he doesn't buy anything, but he consumes resources in the game, you know, just to make it difficult for you. You know, it's a different game experience. Sometimes I don't know if it really works for all the games, but they just make it to get people they check to a box. buy it. Yeah. They check a box. Well, we got to have a solo. Okay. Mm-hmm. We did check that, but it doesn't make it worthy of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause I look for games that usually have a two player minimum. And like, if a game has a three player minimum, I'm probably not going to buy it. But if it has up to a one player minimum, it's like, heck, that's appealing because, you know, then I can solo it and stuff like that. And that's where I've run into those bots and I'm annoyed by those. <laughs> and it, and yeah. you know what's even more annoying? <laughs> the games that go down to one player and they have two bots. Okay. Oh, yeah. You tricked me into yeah. buying a three player game with two bots. Right. All right. Right. All right. Yep, give me my money back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they release their next game. Here, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no I learned nothing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you say deluxe, you put the word deluxe on it, I'm sold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Kickstarter. <laughs> it's If it's a board game with deluxe or it's a burger with deluxe. Lim- Either one. <laughs> sold. <laughs> or pizza. <laughs> I'll oh, take it. Geez. Yeah. So we never learn. No, no, we don't. So yeah, that's uh yeah, there's there's a couple of, of different ways to look at these games, right? There's table presence, big and little. One is harder than the other, right? And oh, mm-hmm. and I wanted to mention this earlier. I, I thought of this while you while you were talking about the of the sizing of the games. And you know, I, I see on BGG a lot of people posting. It's like, you know, what game can we play on an airplane? I try to play a, play a game on an airplane. It does not work. No, it does not work. Yep. You're better off just playing on a tablet or sleeping. Or play the digital show. version. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because I've tried to put a game out on a on the tray. <laughs> And there's just too much stuff going on. Then the food comes through or snacks or drinks and and food. What are you first class? There's no <laughs> food in last class. Yeah. <laughs> when I say food, I meant your biscoff. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Your cookies. Your peanut, your pretzels and yeah. Yeah, your biscoff so, cookie. And then some of these planes now have these like super itty bitty little trays yes where you can barely fit like a drink cup on it (laughs) so uh yeah the days of the bigger trays might be behind us because it's all about cramming people into them you know it yeah or if you want to play a game and you want to travel just take the boat and then you have like what two weeks <laughs> to get to Europe or something. There you go. <laughs> Just take a really slow cruise. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we could do that. We could take a cruise, go to Essen <laughs> and we'll play two weeks of games. Then we get there <laughs> <laughs> and then fly back saying, we'll never do that again. Exactly. But buy your tickets first. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Before you book your flight or your board. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it's, you, we've got table presence. We've got, um, you know, there's the scope of the game. There's like the huge productions like Gloomhaven. There's very simple games. And then, uh, there's weights of games, right? The very simple games, um, all the way to the brain burner mega games. I want, you know, I wonder, are there any games that are actually five on BGG? I wonder. 
I bet you, I bet you there is something, or maybe Tricky. it's uh maybe you can never truly hit a five. Cause I know that they tweak their algorithm so that people can't game it. You know what I mean? And then like tweak the, the numbers like either high or low or whatever. They've been down that road. They apparently learned when they first started to be GG. Yeah. But so yeah, so there's size, there's weight. Oh man. What? You know what's I just was at the board game BGG page and I hit the rank button to reverse it. So the low was on the high. Do you know tic tac toe is the lowest ranked game? And then it's shoots and ladders in Candyland and war and the number fifth lowest ranked is something you said that you loved bingo (laughs) bingo yes and then monopoly (laughs) out of out of what like four hundred thousand games probably twenty seven thousand two sixty nine yeah um is monopoly 27, 274 is tic tac toe and dead last. With I think it was Brass Birmingham and number one. Wow. That's wow. funny. Tic tac toe is last, huh? Tic tac toe is last. That's probably the game that everybody first originally started with. And that's probably you can why play it it's at the last. restaurant and it's on every kid's menu. <laughs> yeah. Cause... No, I was trying to find out how you like how can you find um, the like the rating, like the the weight, and sort by that? I'm gonna have to figure that out on PGG. Yeah, it's got to be a way to do that. Yeah, I bet there's a way to do it. It's probably a geek list or something, or one of those advanced searches. Yeah, maybe. Here, let me see. Advanced search. Minimum, let's see. Uh, average, okay, so there's the average gameplay weight, one to five. So if I just say, I'm just going to say four to five. Let me just do a four to five. Now let me do like a 4.5 to five and just see what happens. So... It gave me seven pages. Let me just do a five then. Yeah, I just did five to five and. Did it give it to you? I don't know about this. So like, there's a game called Total War. It's a five out of five. 6,000 minute playing time. Oh. Oh, yeah. Total War. So there's four pages of games that are rated out of five. How is Uno, Uno Dare Adults Only rated a five? Oh, there's uh, uh, lots of, most of these look like war games. Yeah, they are. Yeah, there's, there's some of these that like are ridiculous. I, and it makes sense to me, like uh, Advanced Squad Leader, is like the second one in that list forgotten war korea 1950 to 53 hmm. yeah these are the ones it's basically like you get like old school yellow pages for a big city <laughs> that is the instruction manual there's oh, like uh, a rule for everything yeah no thanks yeah that's not i a don't five. think i'll ever no play thanks, any it's of not these a five yeah <laughs> oh here's a spongebob square pants great jellyfish escape <laughs> how is that a five <laughs> that can't be that's got to be filtered now it says it's a five well it's probably one person that voted for it or something like that because i noticed on the uh, search page it shows you know between five and five with a minimum of X votes or something like that. So, but someone that's probably not a five. It's probably not. They probably, probably thought it was like, Ooh, rating it a five. Like 
it's a kid's game. There's no way it's got to be a complexity. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's, it's, these are all war games and it, it makes sense. And that's just from the complexity, like, <sighs> you know, a lot of rules and, measuring and very specific you know with terrain and you know weather and who knows what else so that makes sense so we have our answer they do exist yeah, yeah. all righty so yeah we did good time almost two hours for the show Oof. yeah do, do you right. want to add anything uh before we kind of um, take it out I uh, just was going to say I did get some new stuff to the shelf that I haven't played yet. They're still sitting here. Where do you, I need to find shelf space and I need to uh, unwrap them and stuff. But I picked up Ancient Knowledge with the, um, was it Ancient History expansion or something like that? Uh, yes. I got Red uh, Rising. Wait, Heritage or something like that? Is that Heritage? Ancient, is that it? Yeah. So I got, yeah, I got that one expansion for Ancient Knowledge. Um, Red Rising from Stonemaier Games. And I picked up Star Trek Star Realms. So I was looking at this like a, a week ago. It was on the store shelf and I was like, I like Star Realms and I like Star Trek. And I was like, ooh, man, I got to have the Star Trek. And it is. It's a Star Trek skinning of Star Realms. It's a, it's an exact one-to-one basically just with everything star trek related and actually the cool thing is you can play the box allows you to play up to four players instead of two because they have four different um, like there's the federation the dominion the romulans and the klingons so out of the box instead of just two players you can play four which i think is cool okay. and then if you have two sets they actually have game modes that support like up to six players but it does require two copies of the game, but I'm good with one. Um, and then I also picked up Viticulture. I got the essential okay. edition. It was at my store the other night and it was on their used shelf. Ooh. The freaking thing is like brand new, man. Looks like it might've been played one time. And so I picked that up. And then of course, uh, one of my friends was like, well, now you got to pick up the Tuscany expansion. She's like, that is so good for that. So I went out and ordered that. <laughs> <laughs> of course the essential edition of that one so that one's on its way so then you have to yet. get vinos which is a vital Serta game <laughs> oh no i got one continue right. with the, already, the wine nope. theme nope. So i don't even drink so you but, don't have uh, to <laughs> and then i did add arc nova has arrived and there was something else that came with that and i can't remember what it was but those are new to my to my shelf. Okay. Oh. Did you get any uh boxes in this you, week? You betcha. I got uh Footsteps of Darwin. So I was curious on that one because it was a SDJ game. Uh I did get Daybreak. Also SDJ. That was the winner, I believe. For Kenner, I think. Mm, yeah, I think you're right. Like, yeah. Uh Planta Nubo which is the new Uve game. Um, I got that tower up. Is that it? Tower, tower up. Yep. Oh, I, that that's the other yeah, one I got. I can never remember yeah. that name for some reason. Apparently you can't either. <laughs> I, that's right. That was the other one that came with mm -hmm. my arc Nova was tower up. Yeah. Yeah. I got that one and. Oh man. Uh, the new undaunted. Callisto 2200 or something like that. Ah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. That is a, I was really intrigued by it because it's a really heavy box and it's a lot bigger than the other, the previous Undaunted's because it's, you know, space based 2200. Right. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like, you know, what's in here? So there's four massive boards in it. That's most of the weight uh, in the game. So mystery solved, but I think that was, I think that was it. No, no, no. And, and I also got Yunnan because BG had the Spielworks sale. I got Yunnan and I 
trying to peer over this stack of stuff. <laughs> I'll just roll the dice while we wait. <laughs> Smoky Valley. That was the other one. Smoky Valley. Never heard of it. Smoky Valley. Yeah, Spielworks. I've I've still got the Spielworks FOMO because yeah. <laughs> they used to print like a thousand games and that was it. And you know, it's like uh, I really like their games. So whenever they would come out with something, it's always like, oh, gotta gotta get it, get it, get it, because they are <laughs> never to be seen ever, ever again. Spielworks. Yeah, they got a new uh there's something on Kickstarter that they just launched most recently. Yeah, it's they're uh predominantly a one man show. Huh. This guy named Uli. But mm-hmm. it was uh Yeah, like he did uh they did La Granja. Arkwright. Yeah, the one that I wanted was Auf der Waltz. I, I really wanted to get that one, but I, I missed the boat. And that one was some of the older ones. Gentis. That's I got I got the new one of that. I backed that one. La Granja. That's a really good game. If you I think if you like Orleans or Orleans, uh, you will like La Granja. I think you gave me that one. <laughs> I don't think I've played it yet. Oh yeah, I th- I think I did. I'm such I'm a pretty sure. Friend. I am an amazing friend, and I'm a terrible friend because I haven't even played it yet. But you can you teach are. me. That's that's we true. We can play it here soon. That's true. Maybe I don't have it. No, I, I, I think I I think I did get it, give it to you because uh, that was uh, when I picked. I got the like oh, new there, deluxe yeah, version. Yeah, yeah, and you gave me the old used version. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, I do see it on my list. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, all right. So enough of that. Let's close yep. this bad boy out. Uh, we are officially over the two hour mark. Ooh. It's been a while. It so, has been. Yeah, yeah. But we can do it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So uh thanks for listening, everybody. Catch you all on the next one on episode what eighty four? Yeah, yeah, nope. this is eighty three. So catch you all in the next one. Eighty version or not version. Episode eighty four. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> And Mark will see you at the table.